With the realization that a sharp stone or a blunt stick could cause more damage than fists or teeth, a new era, without exaggeration, began. By the time our own species had taken shape, there were already sharp wooden stakes and fully crafted spears with stone tips. Likely, people also realized that bodies covered in tough hides suffered less from blows. With the mastery of basic, primitive metallurgy, a wide variety of melee weapons appeared. In most regions, copper, bronze, and later steel-hardened iron remained scarce resources for a long time, making it unfeasible to use these valuable metals to create armor, which required large amounts. Though, as with any rule, there were exceptions, with some tribes boasting wealthy aristocracies that were not shy about investing in themselves and protective gear. Antiquity also saw the rise of large militarized states and the first professional armies. But the peak of personal defense evolution was reached with full steel breastplates and ultimately full armor, which became popular in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. It's essential to understand that this wasn't just some abstract evolution in smithing. The main reason was that warfare in the Middle Ages was a domain of the feudal elite. This elite would sometimes call on the lower classes, archers, infantry, but battles without knights were almost unimaginable. The feudal lords were landowners with peasants working their lands, making up around 90% of the population. Naturally, some of the peasant output went to the landowners, Decent fortunes allowed them to spare no expense on weapons and armor. Meanwhile, monarchs who needed a counterbalance to some powerful nobles granted cities freedoms, boosting the craft industry. This led to a synergy between wealthy knights and craftsmen eager to earn more, giving rise to magnificent armor. It's fair to say that the late 14th and 15th centuries saw armor development outpacing weaponry. Full plate armor offered good protection against swords, arrows, and there's no convincing evidence that crossbow bolts could pierce it. Plate armor could even withstand shots from the early firearms of the 15th century, often used to test the final product. For the record, firearms that could pierce armor did exist, but were heavy, awkward, and unwieldy. While plate armor didn't make a knight invulnerable, it did greatly increase survival chances in battle. And remember, each piece of armor was custom-made. One breastplate might be like a Japanese-made car, while another could be far less reliable. But after peaking in the 16th century, plate armor quickly took a back seat. And here, I often hear what I believe are mistaken assumptions, like muskets making armor obsolete. Equipping a knight was expensive and impractical and so on. First, it's important to know that any protection on the battlefield isn't useless. Bullets and shrapnel have different piercing power at various ranges. In fact, even by the early 19th century, a document titled Detailed Instructions on Manufacturing and Maintenance of Soldier Firearms and Blades suggests that a musket bullet could pierce a German-forged steel breastplate only within a range of 115 meters, and that was modest. In 1825, breastplates could shield against musket fire from over 40 meters. The breastplate covering the chest and back weighed around 8.5 kilos. A chest plate with hard steel combined with softer metals couldn't be pierced at 19 meters. There's also a record of tests on breastplates made at Zlatust Armory in 1881. A breastplate weighing under 4 kilos withstood bullets from a burden rifle at 85 meters. Similar documents and accounts are plentiful, not to mention that edged weapons were still in use up to the 20th century. Second, knights didn't need to be outfitted. As landowners, they usually bought all their own military gear. So when the elite stopped buying armor and opted for fine clothes and luxury items instead, the economy didn't fundamentally change. By the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, transformations occurred. Royal power grew, leading to the age of absolute monarchy. Nobles became courtiers, essentially officials. Removed from their castles and battles across Europe, now living in cities, they engaged in endless duels. As firearms allowed soldiers of all sizes to be effective, monarchs arrived at a logical solution. The 17th century saw the advent of military service, where peasants could be conscripted for 10 or so years of service, often with only symbolic pay. With our species' tendency for in-group loyalty, a rousing speech could spark patriotism. In the end, by only providing weapons without protective gear or decent pay, monarchs got vast armies. The average weight of a steel cuirass was 5 to 6 kilograms and saying it made a knight clumsy is incorrect. For example, a modern soldier's 6 B-45 vest weighs more, though linear tactics required little agility. Now there is one thing worth noting, 
A soldier from the Napoleonic era, despite lacking any protective gear, carried up to 45 kilograms, which is more than the weight of a full set of medieval knight's armor. Part of this load was supplies, water, and clothes. It's evident that while cuirasses weren't a firearm cure-all, they could reduce casualties significantly. But in modern times, cuirasses were elite armor for cuirassiers and officers. These pieces of armor, contrary to what some might think, didn't disappear at the end of the Middle Ages. As mentioned earlier, they remained quite effective, not just against cold weapons, but also against bullets and shrapnel. When conscription replaced mercenaries in the 17th century, cuirasses faded from mass infantry use. Increasing survival wasn't a priority for authorities. Sadly, human life was undervalued. During the Napoleonic Wars, the Russian Empire and France's armies were about 1.5% of their populations. Most funds went to arms, ammo, and food, with recruits easily found in villages. And that's why there wasn't really a need for protective gear. In fact, the same situation continued into the 20th century. While you can find plenty of material about police armor and various prototypes from both world wars that offered some level of protection, there just weren't any standard military protective gear. It wasn't until the 50s that serious efforts were made to develop anything beyond helmets. The result was the creation of the American M1951 vest and the Soviet 6B1. These were lightweight protective gear made from nylon, reinforced with aluminum plates. I think it's safe to say that this equipment didn't quite measure up to a solid steel breastplate. In fact, pretty much any bullet could pierce through these vests. However, their main purpose was to protect against smaller shrapnel, which was responsible for the deaths of up to 70% of soldiers. But they really didn't become widespread or standard issue for the troops. The 6B1, for instance, was produced in only a few thousand copies. Oddly enough, the age of standard issue body armor for troops began only recently, in the 1980s. Moreover, both American and Soviet bulletproof vests from the 1980s essentially remained in service until the early 21st century. They were made with Kevlar, a synthetic fiber originally developed for tires in the 1960s. While easily cut, Kevlar can absorb energy from bullets and shrapnel if traveling below 500 meters per second and when dry. Moisture significantly reduces protective properties. Specifically, thanks to the combination of Kevlar and steel or titanium plates, bulletproof vests weighing about 4 kilograms were created in the 80s, which guaranteed roughly 40% protection for the torso against bullets and almost complete protection against shrapnel. Their use allowed, on average, to reduce losses in personnel by a third. But the era of truly effective bulletproof vests only began recently, already in the 21st century. Surprisingly, metal was left behind to enhance performance. Today's military armor comes in protection classes with four in the US, six in Russia, and nine in the EU. They all provide similar results, with top-level armor stopping 10 grams of metal at speeds over 800 meters per second. The 5th grade 6B45 of Russia's Ratnik equipment fully protects against AK-47, M16, and SVD sniper bullets from as close as 10 meters. Advanced modern armor stops sniper and armor-piercing rounds. However, sacrifices were needed to achieve this. Modern armor is made from ceramic with Kevlar backing. Ceramic is harder than steel but brittle, shattering upon impact while breaking the bullet. Kevlar catches the fragments. A major downside is that modern ceramic armor degrades quickly, making it almost disposable. Also, an AK-47 bullet can release 2,000 joules of energy, equivalent to 20 English longbow arrows, or five heavy crossbow bolts hitting at once. The SVD's bullet can reach 4,000 joules, potentially causing organ damage or death even if stopped by armor. But overall, today's soldiers are better protected than 20, 50, or 100 years ago. And here you might say that technology never stands still and there's nothing surprising about it. But that's not entirely true. U.S. General Mark Brown shared some fascinating numbers. In the 1940s, outfitting a soldier cost $170, adjusted for inflation. During Vietnam, it exceeded $1,000. By the early 21st century, it surpassed 17,000, a hundred times more than mid-20th century gear. Now this figure is approaching $30,000 and seems likely to continue growing. And this isn't just thanks to advancements in modern economy and technology. In reality, improvements in soldier gear are happening alongside a reduction in infantry numbers and a shift from its traditional role. Today, 
The development of air forces, missile systems, and various types of mass destruction weapons has made the classic war scenarios of the past almost unthinkable. In any conflict between major geopolitical powers, any large gatherings of infantry and heavy equipment are likely to be quickly wiped out. And that's not even considering the impact of such conflicts on the world economy and environment. Modern warfare mainly plays out in regions outside the G20, which, by the way, produces 85% of the world's gross product. The competition for resources and political influence is happening on the economic periphery, where success often depends on high-precision weapons, missiles, aircraft, and well-trained, small but effective infantry units capable of seizing key positions. History, in its own ironic way, has come full circle. From the well-equipped medieval knights, we transitioned, due to firearms in progress, to large infantry forces with no real armor. And now, due to those same advancements in weaponry, infantry numbers are shrinking while their protective gear levels are rising. Though the soldiers' direct role on the battlefield is decreasing, in several countries, they're already developing the next generation of protective gear, commonly referred to as future soldier equipment. This often includes exoskeletons and other gadgets that seemed like sci-fi just a short while ago. It's likely that soon we'll be in a situation somewhat reminiscent of medieval times, where the protective gear for infantry from major geopolitical powers will be far superior to that of soldiers in third world countries. And since humanity is still far from creating a rational, reasonable society, the clash between armor and weapons will continue, 